Well, the Greeks held that the visual arts were the imitation of life, but the computer arts are the imitation of creation itself. Thank you very much. <laughs> My name is John Schock. Uh, I have both the great privilege and the challenge of introducing Alan Kay, our banquet speaker. Uh, why, why do I say that it's both a privilege and a challenge? Well, my first reaction when I was called up and, and invited to come make some brief remarks and introduce Alan uh, was that I was very flattered, and I really appreciated the invitation, uh, that although I'm in the venture capital business these days here in Palo Alto, I spent 14 years at Xerox. And I was, in fact, hired into the Palo Alto Research Center shortly after it was formed by Alan Kay. And one of the many anecdotes I've chosen not to tell tonight is about exactly the manner in which Alan hired me, uh, which is a great story that I'll save for later when Alan and I decide to embarrass both of us. Um, or at least when he will tell his version and I'll tell mine. Um, but it was a wonderful time working for Alan, and many of you, of course, know him. And it was a period where I got to participate in some tremendously challenging and wonderful research, and we have lots of wonderful stories. So I instantly accepted, foolishly, and, and as soon as I hung up, uh, and I thought about it for another 30 milliseconds, the trepidation set in. Because how do you go about introducing someone who needs no introduction, uh, to use a trite phrase? And as I said, I considered lots of stories and anecdotes, and I concluded that I would just stick to a few of the formalities and then just a brief observation. As I said, many of you, <laughs> many of you know Alan, of course, and, and, and I'd like to think he needs no introduction, yet conversely, I'd like to think that there are at least some people here who were not only the participants back at the, in those times, and that we're not just talking to ourselves, but there might be a few people who don't know that. Alan, of course, has a PhD from Utah. He taught at Stanford, joined Xerox Park, went on a sabbatical to USC ISI, went from there to Atari, and is now at Apple as an Apple Fellow. I think that's about right, and that's all I'm going to do on that, Alan. Um, those credentials are not the reasons, of course, why Alan has been invited uh, to come here tonight. Uh, rather, it is what I would characterize as almost two decades of a commitment to an idea that spans more than the individual contributions. And that is the idea of powerful personal tools, including but not limited to computers, for children of all ages. Uh, Thomas Kuhn, in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revol uh, Revolutions, talks about shifts in paradigm and that those are the important inflection points in the evolution of science. And I believe that's what we've seen with personal workstations, that they represented a different kind of paradigm for computing. And when you step back and try to integrate over all the individual contributions in many of the speeches we've seen here, the work that I and others were involved in, I really think it is that shift in paradigm. Now, now having that idea of that alternate paradigm of personal workstations and powerful tools is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Because in order to succeed, you have to be able to lead others, to exhort them to accomplish more than they thought possible than, than they thought that they were able to accomplish. So you have to be able to establish a vision and then describe that vision. And Alan has been able to do that, to create those targets, those images, in both words and pictures. Uh, many of you are familiar with some of his expressions, the pursuit of the holy grail, the establishment of a target that we can then try to reach, even if it appears to be well beyond our reach. The Dyna book, of course, is the most well-known of those, although that's only one of many. And those of you who have had a chance to dig through some of the papers will recognize other visions and symbols that were used, including the reading machine, the kitty comp, the mini comp, the flex machine, also known as the reactive engine, and probably many more that I don't know about, Alan. Uh, in addition, he combined that vision with the ability to express it in ideas and in expressions that we will probably not likely forget. Uh, many of us have heard the exhortation that software is, of course, just like a waffle. You have to be prepared to throw out the first one. Um, we all took. We all took part in a, uh, in a meeting that, and in an off-site session at Baharo Dunes, which many of us would have thought was a retreat to go talk about strategy, 
which Alan rechristened as a strategic, as a strategy advance. And at that meeting, he exhorted all of us to uh, break out of what we had done and to go back and burn the disc packs. Um, on the other hand, not all of those expressions were associated with the computer business. And one of the fondest memories I have, which I thought of as I drove down here today, was one year, many years ago, Alan, I think we went out for a drink with Bob Barton, who had come to visit. And we went to a, a local watering hole in Palo Alto, which is now closed and turned into a Mexican restaurant. And uh, as we walked in, and we were gonna, gonna just stop and chat a little bit, and we walked in, and Alan sort of looked around, and in his inimitable style looked around, and said, yeah, it's a nice place, sort of a plush sewer. <laughs> and uh, uh, he's had a tremendous uh, uh, ability at creating images that can motivate us, establishing targets. And without further ado, and uh, without further comment, let me invite Alan Kay up to come and talk about his vision of personal workstations. Thank you all very much. So again. Now, I was reading Toynbee the other day, and I know he's out of fashion, but uh, there was a section that was particularly interesting, which is how do you judge a civilization? Do you judge it on its art, its music, its social uh, functions, its government? Well, I think uh, 100 years from today, our civilization will be judged by the complexity of audiovisual equipment necessar necessary to put on a uh, presentation like this. <laughs> and. Uh, I think we should all look at one gloomy note before I start, and that is to realize that there's not a single computer involved up here helping us show anything here. And I'd also, at this point, like to ask everybody to raise their personal computer in the air. <laughs> Can I see it? <laughs> I rest my case. OK, let's, can I start off with the first slide, please? Now. I have to warn you um, that the, to me, uh, the coupling of work and station is the ultimate oxymoron. <laughs> because uh, I titled my paper, <coughs> Yet to be Finished, PlayStations. Because, because most of the stuff that, uh, that I was interested in had to do with advancing forms of play. And when I was a, a kid, I got very involved with Walt Disney's Fantasia. And it was images like these that entranced me. Now, my background is my, my father was a physiologist and my mother was an artist and a musician. And I grew up working both sides of the street going along. And Fantasia completely blew me away as a sort of a way of combining uh, many of the senses together. And I thought, gee, it would be really neat to be able to do your own Fantasia. And then I thought nothing more of it, for, uh, for puberty had happened. And one does not think of thoughts like that at age 14. And of course, that one uh, is, is the kind of thing you think of at age 14. <laughs> But uh, you know, we just have, we have to admit there is a little power urge in all of us. And uh, <laughs> that image particularly struck me. Now, also, uh, at, when I was a teenager, I started reading uh, science fiction. And I discovered that Robert Heinlein uh, would occasionally mention things in his science fiction books that actually had existed. And he used them as context. And one of the things he mentioned was the tachistoscope which I discovered actually had been invented and was used for uh, measuring uh, reaction times and ability of people to see whether they could read a word in a five hundredth of a second. The other thing that Heinlein mentioned was uh, memex, which he used as a generic term. And I had learned that if I went to the library and poked around long enough, I could find almost any of Heinlein's references. And sure enough, I found, as we may think, written in July 1945 by Vannevar Bush. And I read it with great interest, and I think that uh, I would like to sort of revolve my talk around Bush in a couple of ways, because I think the, the power of Bush's vision was not that he tried to extrapolate from technology, but rather he took what should happen and then tried to justify it by looking at technology that could, be, could happen. In other words, he took a proactive view rather than a reactive one. And uh, my belief is that, in fact, Bush would have thought up the Dynabook um, if he had his work habits involved going to all-night restaurants. 
but in fact, he was a preacher of his times and uh, liked to work at a desk. And so his envision of what a personal workstation should be was a desk. And uh, when I started thinking uh, similar thoughts, uh, I had found long before that I could never work at a desk. And in order to get anything done, I had to go to an all-night restaurant and take showers. So some of the early uh, ideas for the Dyna book was that it would be very, very portable and waterproof. <laughs> Um, now, I guess the other thing I should say before I launch into this thing is that the, uh, all the stories that we've heard at this conference are success stories except mine. And I, c I consider it my jo job, my duty, to fail as strongly as I possibly can uh, in a direction. Because I think that the, one of the differences between practical research and sort of far out research is the difference between goals and directions. In other words, we're taught that it's a very good idea to make up goals. And in fact, it is compared to just probing around randomly. But I think that one of the lessons of Park that turned out to be very powerful was that the most powerful thing you can do is set up a set of directions. And I think of those directions as being like a magnetic field. I thought of us all as being iron filings trying to line up in a magnetic field that we're almost also simultaneously trying to create. Or salmon swimming upstream. In other words, far out research is when you don't know what it is that you're trying to get is done by smelling your way along. You're looking for gradients and so forth and you have directions. And that's good because the goals are the things that drop off first. The goals are the things you succeed at. They're the things you pat yourself on the back. But in fact, the goals, uh, all the goals that we did at Park, I think we realize are obsolete. And yet the directions we had there um, are still as valid as they ever were. Um, now, this is a gazork. And if you don't know what a gazork is, this is a, the console of a 6600. And uh, this is the kind of machine I used to program in the early 60s. Um, and in fact, this machine was a wonderful machine. It had, it had a, about three things that would drive you any, absolutely crazy about it. But aside from that, which, um, it was incredibly simple and incredibly fast. And sitting down at the console of one of these babies um, was just about uh, the right way. I was thinking of Gordon Bell today uh, saying, you buy computers by the pound. And I think one of the ways of summing up what I wanted was about 14 ounces of one of those. <laughs> Slice to order. Now, in, in this uh, first five years of programming around, I saw a couple of great ideas quite a number of times before I started understanding them at all. And when I was trying to write the paper, I was thinking, boy, it is really amazing to me how many times, for instance, I saw object-oriented programming invented by somebody else uh, and liked it, and yet it never hit me uh, for those first five years. Let me give you an example here, see if that goes off. Good. Well, let me just show you something that I ran into when I started programming in the, uh, in the Air Force in 1961. Uh, back then, in, at least in, the, in spite of Doug Ross's early operating systems, uh, the Air Force hadn't learned about them. And uh, Air Training Command had a bunch of Burroughs 220s, which were modest sized machines by today's standards. But in fact, they were rather large physically. And one of the problems the Air Training Command had was passing tapes around. Um, because the operating system wasn't guaranteed to run and they had different, different uh, formats and stuff. And by the time I got there as a fledgling programmer, somebody had thought of this idea. And this is the way they did it. Here's what a file looked like on the Burroughs 220 in Air Training Command. Three sections to it. First section were a bunch of relative pointers. Second section were a bunch of Burroughs 220 machine code. The third second section were a bunch of records. And the way you used this was you read these guys into core and uh, jumped relative through these guys, which you knew what they meant. And that caused execution of these guys, which you didn't have to know what they were. And those guys could get into this stuff, which you didn't know at all. <laughs> In fact, didn't want to. If that is an object-oriented program, I don't know what it is. You're here. So yep. somebody, some nameless person used this technique very, very early. And the macro assemblers of the day 
back then were set up to use it. And I used it too. And yet it didn't hit me how powerful it really was. Here's another one I learned real early and liked but still didn't realize. The Burroughs B5000. Um, that happened to be the replacement computer for the uh, Burroughs 220, but of course Burroughs never had a difficult time building this machine. But in fact, Burroughs B5000 had many, many innovations. And the, one of the chief ones was this notion of trying to build an environment for a higher level language. But the thing that is, was hard to, for me to understand and hard to explain to other people is that the Burroughs B5000 was a, certainly the first piece of hardware, I think, that ever tried to make store into a procedure. And it did it the wrong way. But in fact, uh, it was something that was hardly being thought about back then, except uh, by a couple of people like Doug Ross. Now, when I, as, a, as a programmer back then, I had no knowledge of what was going on in, uh, in ARPA or anything else. We didn't, you know, we enlisted men weren't expected to read. In fact, we didn't, <laughs> just like the students of today. <laughs> so in fact, that was, a, that was another uh, time of seeing a tremendous idea. Then uh, through a series of misadventures, I wound up at the University of Utah. And uh, I discovered a number of interesting things. One was that Dave Evans uh, was much younger than he looked <laughs> and much older than he appeared. <laughs> But in fact, he's one of these guys who, uh, at age 30, just put his appearance on hold. And he's still out there running, running marathons. One of the things that Dave liked was Ivan Sutherland's sketch pad. He had a big pile of these brown Lincoln Labs documents on his desk. And before you found your desk, he would give you one of these. And you had to read it and understand it. And uh, I'd like to show you um, uh, the first sequence from videotape. This is the earliest known movie of Sketchpad. This was done in the summer of 62. I show this a lot today. So here's Ivan with the blood starting to run out of his hand, but that's OK. We, uh, now notice uh, he did something that we all are familiar with, but now he's pointing to all these edges and he's telling Sketchpad to make them all mutually perpendicular. And Sketchpad figures out how to do it. And the reason is that Sketchpad is not just one of the first graphics systems, but it was the first non-procedural programming system. That might be disputed, but let me go on with it. Here again, he's making a couple lines. He's saying, uh, make them parallel and perpendicular, and Sketchpad straightens them up. Now he's using a constraint called collinearity. And the little dashes are uh, aligning themselves right over the guidelines there. Okay, and now he's telling the guidelines to be invisible. And he's made his hole through the flange. You notice that Sketchpad is the first system to have a window, as far as I know. In fact, it drew on a very large virtual uh, canvas. Now he wants to make a rivet. And once again, he only has to indicate the general topology and the rules that will constrain the topology into being what he wants. That's going to be the center of an arc. And now notice this clever thing, that if he makes these mutually perpendicular, that will force the, uh, well, you see what I mean. There it is. And now if he distorts it, it will still obey that general geometry. Now, he could have constrained the ratios of the sides just as well and kept the, the, uh, the rivet a specific shape. In this case, what he's done is constrained the angle relationships and center relationships, so we always get a symmetric rivet. Now, Sketchpad is also, I believe, the first true object-oriented programming system. Because what we see here is actually a dynamic instance of that master drawing that was just done. 
He called them masters. Now, nowadays, we call them classes because they're similar. But you notice he can take that instance and twirl it around and make it different sizes. And he's going to uh, stick it into the, the uh, hole of the, in the flange here. And one of the re reasons we can tell how early this is is because uh, in this whole film, there's no illustration of visible constraints. And that uh, came, was a second phase of the implementation of Sketchpad. Here's a few more. Now, you might ask, why is the screen blinking? Well, the TX2 here is putting up every dot by brute force. So he's gone back to the master and he says, well, I really don't want to see those uh, guidelines. I'll make them invisible. And notice all of the instances feel them dynamically. And anything that you can construct in Sketchpad can itself be a master. So this, he's taken these two building blocks, the flange and the rivet, made it into a master, and now he can con create instances from it. Well, if this isn't home looking, I don't know what is. This, this is the kind of thing, if somebody did that today, we would say, my god, that's unbelievable. OK, stop the, stop the tape, please. Because one of the, um, a uh, British, British art historian by the name of Lethaby said that a, ma uh, a work of art is uh, one man wide and many men deep. And Something like Sketchpad has the interesting characteristic is that it's not just a work of art, it's a masterpiece. So it is one big man wide and one big man deep. So most of those ideas were ones that all, though Ivan sort of gathered them up, the data structures came from Doug Ross's uh, papers and there were ideas here and there and he sc scrounged a, a matrix um, a multiplication program from Les Ernest and so forth. The vision here was so pure that it stands up today. If somebody were to do a system as good as Sketchpad today, we would like it. It also is the only known computer graphics thesis in which every illustration was done by the thesis program. <laughs> Think of that. <laughs> OK, so that was pretty exciting. And um, the other, another thing that was exciting at Utah is um, Doug Engelbart who in those days used to travel with a special, this is, this is how much he wanted to communicate with people. He used to travel with a special 16 millimeter movie projector that could stop frame. And he would be there with, he would be there with one of these things and his stop frame thing. And the reason is, is it's very hard to explain a system as good as NLS in a dynamic movie. It's hard to see where the cursor is and it's hard to see what's going on. And so he had, he had evolved this style of talking about it that was really incredible. And as I recall, the movie he showed then uh, had a green, green characters on a screen. And I think it was the 3100 implementation of the system. Well, it completely blew our minds at Utah. We just could hardly believe what he was trying to, to do. And of course, it has some roots in Bush's ideas also. But in fact, one way of characterizing Bush is that he was trying to be, to find something that was complementary, a complement to human abilities. This is the way he writes in his paper. And Doug was trying to augment human abilities. And if, if I could characterize what I tried to do after seeing his stuff, it was to try and allow the system itself to be augmented by the human. So that the augmentation would actually be mutual back and forth. And I still believe that is the main problem of personal computing. But anyway, uh, uh, I think all of us who were at the 1968 Fall Joint Computer Conference, and I know Butler mentions it in his paper, uh, this was, I, I can't take the time to tell you about it, but believe me, it was like magic. ARPA spared no expense, thanks to Bob Taylor. Uh, I, I hesitate even now to mention the figure that they spent to put that on. <laughs> I'll let Taylor decide to say if he ever wants to. But <laughs> believe me, the, the whole objective of this thing was they had to illustrate what the concept was. And they spared nothing to make it, uh, to make it work. And it was 
an unbelievable thing, even for those of us who are fairly familiar with the system. Just never forget it ever. I've forgotten the number, Alan, but it was worth 10 times the cost. <laughs> yeah, it was. I, I do remember the number, and uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Never knew how much it cost. <laughs> <laughs> now, there are some other things that aren't easy to talk about, but I just have to say that um, there have been many people who have had an enormous influence on me in my uh, somewhat strange career. Uh, one of the greatest has, is Butler Lamson. And um, the SDS 940 was one of the things, that machine was so wonderfully designed, I can't tell you, but that was the machine that Doug Engelbart's uh, stuff was implemented on. It was one of the major uh, machines, thanks to Bob Taylor again, that uh, we used in the ARPA community. And again, it wasn't just the, uh, the fact that it was uh, rather inexpensive and rather responsive and so forth. There was a whole set of secondary things in that system that were so important. For instance, Butler had this odd notion that machines occasionally crashed. And uh, in fact, the system was designed uh, mainly for crash recovery. And so those of us uh, who used the machine can remember many years in a very flaky era where we'd hardly lose more than a couple of characters a year, if that through many, many crashes. I can't explain all the details why, but it was beautiful and it made a tremendous impression. Now, those influences, thanks to Dave Evans, who hooked me up with a crazy Texan by the name of Ed Cheadle, uh, result in this design in this machine called the Flex Machine. This is sort of in a general period, uh, 1967 to 69. And while I was doing this, I looked at the, the link of Wes Clark but, and liked it very much, but in fact, I didn't understand it. I originally uh, poo-pooed it because it didn't execute a higher level language, and it was small and all of these things. And, uh, but I'll return to that story in a minute. So here's what the Flex machine looked like and it's, uh, as drawn on its own display. And uh, we actually, uh, we like Doug's idea of tying a brick to a pencil as sort of a de-augmentation concept, but we sort of thought that's what a mouse looked like too, and uh, thought that tablets might be better, which I still think they are. So we built this, uh, built a tablet. And uh, windowing was in the air then. Uh, there was a lot of hookup between Utah and Harvard, where Ar Ivan was at that time, uh, wearing about, Ivan especially was wearing about 3D clipping and windowing, and Cheadle and I were wearing about 2D clipping and windowing, and uh, the Flex Machine had a 2D uh, windows, and in fact, multiple windows. Um, but of course, in a calligraphic display, it uh, is somewhat a low calorie exercise to uh, overlap windows. It just results in a jumble. What ran on this machine was a simulation language that I had derived from Simula. I essentially uh, had an enormous revelation when I learned Simula the hard way, because I had to and uh, discovered that Simula was a programming language that created the same objects that Sketchpad did all these wonderful things with. And that was an amazing thing because it meant that in some sense, we didn't have to solve the constraint problem in order to do many of the same kinds of things that Sketchpad was able to do uh, with great difficulty. So here's an example of what the, the structures in a, uh, a flex program of the day, uh, there was a scheduling queue which is very similar to uh, uh, Simula, a, an instance that had the local variables for a particular patient. Uh, the instance pointed to what we now call a class, which contained generic patient behavior, and uh, that was how the Flex machine was organized. This is what uh, the Flex code looked like on the Flex display. Uh, this is uh, the Flex machine itself was organized like the B5000. That was one of the worst mistakes I ever made. Um, and not because the B5000 was a good idea, but in those days I didn't understand a very important truth, and that is that good ideas don't often scale. And in fact, we were trying to build a machine uh, that would sit on a desk, 
And uh, we've spent all of this time worrying about the processor and forgot totally that a computer is mostly memory. So that's too bad. But that's that the machine basically had three virtual processors all implemented by one set of microcode. Now, the reason I'm telling this story, of course, is the Flex machine was a complete failure uh, in a variety of ways. Technically, I think it was pretty much of a success. Cheadle was a genius and did a great job. And uh, my problem is when I tried this system out that was designed for lawyers and doctors and so forth, it absolutely appalled them. They shrank away from it like uh, somebody does from the plague or the way people nowadays do from APL. <laughs> Had many, many of the same user-friendly appearances to it. And that was the first time ever in my life I realized that graduate students and the rest of the world were two different breeds. <laughs> uh, we loved it. We thought it was very powerful. And uh, oh, one final thing is the flex machine. This is not a packet switching network, but it did use coax. This, in fact, was what is called an urgency scheduling coax, in which the, trans, uh, the transceivers themselves uh, have an urgency and a priority register, and they sort of vote among themselves as to who's going who's to get the thing. Well, uh, while brooding about all this stuff, I ran across the work of Seymour Papert and had a revelation. And that is, boy, uh, we certainly don't wait until kids are in graduate school to teach them how to read or how to use a pencil. In fact, uh, we like to get them at things as soon as possible. And really, in many ways, the, the idea that Papert thought it was worthwhile teaching kids to program and important so forth changed my whole idea about what a personal computer actually should be. And that is, there should never be a thing called a personal computer that doesn't, isn't accessible to children. There are very few things. It's not dangerous like a car, guys. There's no reason waiting until they're 18 to give them a six months of driver's ed, like the Boyer Report says. In order for it to really be a full-fledged medium, it has to do two things. It has to be accessible to children, and it has to be used for mundane tasks. So one of the things we thought about early when we were th thinking about it is it's, it's a personal computer if you uh, are willing to put your grocery list on it, carry it into the, gro uh, the grocery store and out again with two bags of groceries. How many people would do that with their, what they call their personal computer today? So this notion that it somehow should fit humanity and everything, which is a rather novel one to me, uh, was very important. He taught a course called Advanced Systems Design. And the first day, he told us, well, there are a few things known about systems design, but they, most of them are written down, and I want you to read all of them. But my job in this classroom is to firmly disabuse you of any fondly held notions you might have brought here. So in fact, what he did was to garbage collect our confidence. <laughs> and that was the best thing uh, we ever had. Those of us who lasted out the class and the flying chalk and all that um, walked out of there feeling that nothing was sacred, including Bob Barton. <laughs> Very important. And Bob got me reading McLuhan. And I'm not going to try and explain uh, McLuhan's ideas here, but the, I think the most important thing that has been said in this century uh, is, can be said in two ways. One is McLuhan said, I don't know who discovered water, but it wasn't a fish. <laughs> That's the simple way of putting it. And the other way of looking at it is, in order to pick out a message from the noise, you have to know what the carrier of the message is. So you have to know the difference between a fly speck and a period. That means you have to know what unadorned paper looks like. Uh, and because you have to learn what unadorned paper or unadorned television or unadorned computers are like in order to pick the messages out of them, you have to absorb what they are. So you become what the medium is, what the material is, in order to use it as a tool. That's pretty heavy duty stuff. And uh, because we become it, we, we don't know that we are it. So this idea of actually being able to shape the way people think about things by designing the material carefully was something that became very important. Uh, one of the things that, uh, of course, my old mentor, Dave Evans, has been around a little bit. He was Butler's thesis advisor, my thesis advisor, and uh, was on the Algol committee and a few other things. And one of the things that Dave liked to do with his graduate students is to invite them into high-level negotiation meetings, because he figured that 
uh, graduate school should be a transient place. He hated uh, the idea of it, and he wanted us to learn how to negotiate. So one of the things he did is he invited all of us graduate students into one of the ARPA contractors meetings that was held at Utah. And we were there to watch the big boys uh, deal it out. And it was, it was most interesting, I can tell you. And at the end of the thing, uh, Taylor asked uh, all of us whether we had any suggestions. And of course, there were several. And Warnock piped up saying, you know, uh, if you guys are really, well, he, I, he said it a little more subtly this, but he said, if you guys are really thinking about it, you know, we, we are going to be, have our PhDs pretty soon. All the graduate students should be meeting together right now. And Taylor thought that was a great idea. So they set up a, a similar uh, graduate student contractors meeting every summer. And Warnock and I were the first two to go to, from Utah. And I talked about the flex machine there, and Warnock showed his great algorithm. Uh, but the great thing we saw was at the University of Illinois, which is the very first plasma panel, the first flat screen display. Now, it wasn't this large. This, this display screen violates Kay's law, which is that all one inch flat screen displays work and no five inch flat screen displays work. <laughs> now, that law is still true. But in fact, they did have a one inch uh, flat screen display there. And a lot of us graduate students who were there spent the rest of the time thinking about what it would be like to put a flex machine on the back of that display. Because if you're doing input and output with a display, then uh, all that cubic volume there is absolutely irrelevant. And my new version of Engelbart's brick on the pencil was imagine dragging around a digital watch with a CRT on it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be ridiculous? So this idea uh, wasn't called the Dynabook then, but this idea that this is one of the destinies for uh, the, pr the computer that goes with you uh, started around uh, the summer of 68. And, of course, the, the idea was it should be down at the lowest level um, so that kids this age could use it. And uh, this quaint idea of portability. Now, uh, 0.5 herniations per block is not portability. <laughs> so there's this notion that you should be able to carry something else, too. And now the link came forward really strongly because Everything I started thinking about then reminded me of the link, because the, one of the things, as you'll learn tomorrow, is the link was designed as cleanly as anything has ever been designed. It was beautiful. Uh, you just, I, you know, just I'm salivating right now thinking of it. And that was the first time I learned about it, because I really needed to learn about it, as to what they were actually able to do with almost nothing. It was fabulous, and it's worthwhile studying today. Let's show the, uh, the second segment. Now what this system is, is a system called Grail, done at Rand Corporation. Here's an early menu. And this is the system, this has sound on it. Erase a flow arrow, then move the connector out of the way so that we may draw a box in its place. So it recognizes the box and makes one. Now it's recognizing as printing here. The printing in the box is being used as commentary only in this case. The box is slightly too large, so we may change its size. That's where Mac window control came from. Then draw a flow from the connector to the box. Attach a decision element to the box and draw a flow from it to scan. We then erase the flow arrows attached to the process post new area and move the box to a new position. This allows us to draw a new box, then chop off its corner and label it subscan with a residual error. Now notice it misses the end here, and he sees it, but draw he, a flow he can keep on going. Now he goes, changes it. Correct the label. Add a decision on subscan so that control may flow to the connector A0. Then complete the diagram from scan to post. OK, stop the tape. OK, now that system blew my mind. It came along just at the right time because this system was tactile. It was like sinking your arms right through the glass of the display and touching what you wanted to do. And it didn't matter whether they implemented flowcharts or not. 
But in fact, I found, I read Lick's 1960 paper uh, just recently and discovered there was a section in describing a system just like that. And I think the Rand people uh, had obviously read it also. But this system removed the barriers. You were right there. And I uh, mentioned a couple of other things about it. You could dive through any of those flowchart symbols. It was really a hypertext kind of thing, a multidimensional thing. You could simulate the diagrams. It would flash the diagrams. There's a speed control up there. It was modeless. And modeless doesn't just mean generic. Modeless means that you never have to terminate what you're doing in order to do something else. And you just saw it there. It's one of the most important ideas in user interaction. And this is the first system to really have it in spades. There have been other ideas before. This is great. This system barely worked. It was on such an incredible kludge of hardware and software that it eventually collapsed under its own weight. I used to show this movie about every three months at Park. We used to show it, you know, because we wanted it, we didn't want a system that had flow charts, but we wanted it to be like that. We wanted to have that level of, ta we wanted it to be not even visual, we wanted it to be tactile. Just be organic, you know, it had to be messy and stuff. Okay, uh, let me, let's look at the next slide. And now I'm going to go quickly because my goal is actually to, uh, to get to the park movie in one minute, which I'm not going to be able to do. So here's uh, just some, now of course I knew we couldn't do a Dynabook right then, but this is 1970, and I'd started consulting for Taylor at Park and thought, boy, we should be able to take, take some television sets, and this is the old flex rubber bed sheet tablet. Um, if you want to make one for about 25 cents, this is how to do it. Um, and using LISP techniques now for a simulation to implement the kernel of a simulation language look like a really great idea because you get an incredibly small kernel and the rest of the system is self-describing. Okay, now, um, what I, what I want to do is digress for just a couple of minutes if I can. This is, talk is really in three parts. I'm, right at the end of the first part. Middle part is shorter, and what it is is it's kind of a lie in that this is not exactly the way I was thinking back then. This is after um, 15 years of trying to explain uh, these ideas to people. But this is what, what I'm going to tell you next is what I think really drove what we were trying to do. And it's a much better story than we were able to tell to anybody back then. This is Park. Um, this is the time to give the tribute to Bob Taylor. He actually deserves another one, so I'll say a few more words. Um, now, you notice, let's see if there's one before that. Okay, this is a typical uh, way Park was organized. It was organized this way because Bob, uh, I think, had two goals in mind. One is he wanted to be different. He wanted it to be comfortable. And I think he'd also discovered that it was impossible to leap to your feet to denounce anybody when you were sitting in a beanbag chair. <laughs> <laughs> there is this, there is this curious passivating effect that they had as you slunk in, and I, I think there are many people in the room that remember what they felt like after trying to sleep on one of these, uh, because you, s your body gradually, as you slept, sank into it and it assumed the strangest positions that you woke up. But in fact, this was uh, the way Park was set up. I, I'm not sure who that person is there, but, um, <laughs> and um, that youngster, uh, I don't recognize either, but he doesn't look very trustworthy to me. <laughs> and um, one of the efforts to communicate with Xerox was a set of stuff called the Pendry Papers, and I wrote one called Display Transducers, and this is the drawing that I made for it, showing two ways of doing a display transducer right now. And I won't bother going through the features, but you get the idea. Should look something like that. And Xerox had a projection technology, a light valve technology that had some promise back then, so I threw that in also. Now, this is an important point, I think. The most misunderstood thing about the Dynabook is this idea that it's some kind of box. It isn't a box, and it isn't a piece piece of hardware, what it is is a service. And so the idea back then was it's a Dynabook if it gives you your information services wherever you are on Earth. And so there are lots of different ways. We used to say we don't care if there's an atomic powered computer on the moon beaming down computations as long as you can compute wherever you want. So this is an idea based on um, 
Ivan Sutherland's head-mounted display and realizing that that was a pretty good way of doing it. In fact, that's something that should be looked into today. And then the next effort at Park uh, to get something built was this uh, an, a design idea called Minicom. And this was done in conjunction, actually, with Gordon Bell and Alan Newell. So they remember very well, we sat on this very strange panel at a fall joint computer conference talking about various machine futures. And I went through this machine showing how you could package uh, a thing like a link, but a little bit better into something real small, and it would be really powerful. You could do great stuff with it for kids. And uh, Herb Grosh, uh, who was an old war horse, got up and denounced this whole idea as being absolutely ridiculous. And Fred Brooks, who was the, the fourth person on the panel, said to, to uh, Herb, he, Herb said, I've been in this business for 20 years, blah, 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 blah. And <laughs> Fred, Brooks, Fred Brooks said, Herb, I'd like to make an ad hominem remark. And he said, uh, most of us don't take nearly that long to make up our minds. <laughs> now, of course, I knew that this meant that my ideas were good. Because uh, being denounced by Herb Grosh should be a sign <laughs> that your ideas are good. I, at the same time that um, that was going on, um, a group led by Bill English, who had been the main technical guy for Doug Egelbart, was building a system called Polos. And this is the original uh, design of the Polos terminal. And that will fit into the story. I, I think Butler and Chuck will have a good version of it. And here's the, um, the Engelbart mouse, which uh, uh, was great because it existed, um, but it was very hard to draw with. And I think, the, I think part of the problem with it uh, was that uh, nobody uh, really wanted to draw over there, and it was perfectly fine for everything else. Polos group. Uh, wanted a different mouse. This is sort of the uh, chrome and tail fins <laughs> mouse, but it, it had the same basic drawback, is that you couldn't draw with it. And uh, finally, we built this. Uh, this was uh, an idea of Bill English's and Roger Bates, uh, $200,000 worth of, of hardware. Uh, see. Uh, Butler Lamson, Bill English, Roger Bates. Roger built the thing. This is a thing called the old, the old character generator. Uh, 40 megahertz of video back in 1972, and you could do almost anything that a television screen could do. Driven by Nova, and you could capture images by this television camera. Here's what the, uh, that thing looked like back then. And here's an, an experiment to compare drawing something uh, in a notebook. It's a design of an auto gyro that I did, and comparing it to the best we could do in painting on the system. In, a, in the this is the first bitmap painting system done by Steve Purcell. Now we get to this uh, this middle part because this is this is the pivotal point on which I think most of our ideas revolved, and that is that. At some point, we had to grapple with the idea that there were going to be real people using this stuff. And we had already committed ourselves to children. And when we talked about it among ourselves in, in the spring of 72, our cells were just a few of us, Chris Jeffers, myself, John Schock. Uh, we had no idea what was going on. And here's an illustration of why this is difficult. Now, if you look at this uh, picture for a while, you'll see something wrong with it. Everybody see it? What's wrong with it? Teeth are upside down. What else? Ma whole mouth. What else? The eye. OK, well, let's take a look at it right side up. <laughs> now, notice that even after you knew what the trick was, you still had an emotional reaction when I turned it right side up. It's significant. I have to ch put it back here to talk, because people won't listen to me if I. <laughs> and. Uh, the unfortunate thing seemed to be that um, in order to understand what's going on, we have to admit something that none of us want to admit. And it's not that um, the universe is not in our control. That is awful, but we usually are forced to find that out a lot earlier. But we have to admit something almost a ba as bad, and that is that we don't live in reality, but in a dream of our own fashioning. A uh, good one for people who doubt it. This is something that's good to do every morning, along with your uh, jogging. You take your thumbs or your 
two quarters or an orange, you can do it right now, it's okay. Cameras are on me. <laughs> <laughs> and you hold one as far as away from you as you can and you put the other one about halfway there and compare the two sizes of them. Don't squint, just look at one and then the other. And most of you will see that the one that's further away is about 80% the size of your thumb. If you do it with quarters, the quarter will be even closer in size. And if you think about that, that can't be because uh, that image of the smaller one on your retina is exactly one half the size. So what's actually going on is you're not seeing what your eyes are seeing, but you're seeing a reconstruction based on uh, your beliefs of the world. And it's that reconstruction that allows theatrical performances to work. <clears throat> and it was understanding that user interface is basically theater that advanced us uh, quite a bit of the way. Now, <clears throat> oh, I should tell you the, let me tell you the final part of the story is this, this uh, illusion is actually known about physiologically. Um, on the under right hand side of your brain where you worry about faces, there are two completely distinct little modules. One module worries about face-like things. That's the thing that allows you to see faces in clouds and scares children uh, in twilight and so forth when they shadows look like a face and they think it's a monster. And that's reporting an upside-down face-like thing. And about an inch away, a separate piece of brain tissue is only worried about eyes and mouth. And it's saying, well, that's an okay mouth and those are okay eyes. So there's very little dissonance here. When we go to this guy, the um, face recognition guy is saying that's an, a right side up face like thing and the eyes and mouth guy is saying something is very wrong here. <laughs> now you can imagine why evolution might have arranged for you to worry about this because it might mean you're gonna die in the next 10 <laughs> seconds. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, um, now, I can, I can tell you it also, it also works on mammals. It also works on all mammals. And if you'd like to try it out on a dog, I suggest you pick a small one. <laughs> okay. This is the place that's going to start the third part because that is the first image ever to go on in alto. And um, let me now continue with uh, this, our misunderstanding of how the mind works. <coughs> what I'm presenting here are not my ideas, but <clears throat> once I got this strange idea that the, the our mentalities might be modular. It reminded me a lot of reading Piaget, which I never really understood very well. Uh, that is Piaget's fault, by the way, in case you <laughs> don't feel bad when you read Piaget and find it fumbling, verbose, and obscure, because in fact, that's the way he writes. Um, read somebody else's summary of the stuff. The ideas are kind of good. Um, so. Piaget had this idea that there are three main stages of development in children, a sort of a doing stage, which he had a long, complicated word for, uh, an image stage and a symbol stage. The doing stage is where an object is to grasp it and a hole is to dig it. The image stage is where the kid gets the water pouring wrong. You know, you pour from the squat glass into the tall, thin one, and the kid says there's more water. And then uh, Piaget says around 11 or 12, the child starts dealing with facts and logic, which uh, I think is a special property of uh, Swiss-French children. Which is <laughs> I've, I've, always, I've always felt it's around that age that logic fast disappears. <laughs> now, Jerome Brunner, now, uh, Jerome Brunner is, was the person, I think, of all of the people that I read that influenced me the most. Uh, he wrote a number of books that are classics. Unlike Piaget, uh, Brunner is one of the, the classic writers of prose in the English language. And around the early 60s, he was pushing the following idea that instead of being stages of development, what we've got going in children are actually separate mentalities and a change of dominance. 
So one of the experiments that uh, Brunner did is to take a kid who would uh, do the water pouring thing wrong. He would say there's more water in the tall, thin glass. And then Brunner would immediately cover up that tall, thin glass with a cardboard. And the kid would say, oh, wait a minute. There must be the same amount of water, because where could it go? And Brunner would take it away, and the kid would look at the glass. And he said, oh, but there's more. Look at it. And Brunner would cover it up again. And the kids would say, oh, there, there must be the same, because where could it go? So if you have any 10-year-olds you'd like to torment, <laughs> bouncing them back and forth here. And you do it partially by blocking the visual field. And so Brunner had convinced himself that there are actually separate mentalities with separate rules. And of course, there are people like Gombrich and Arnheim who thought the same thing about the way we look at images and do visual thinking, uh, that Brunner built a curriculum around it. And the curriculum had several interesting ideas. One was, it's really great to learn things in this order. Because even though the symbolic one is, is the most powerful, it's only powerful when it's in the right context. In other words, what Brunner said is that logic is a weak method. It's really great when you're in the right territory, but it stinks when you aren't. Because uh, it forces you to uh, build up chains of things that don't lead you anywhere. Uh, well, in other words, uh, if you want to multiply two numbers in 60 AD, you're in trouble. If you want to find out where Mars is going to go in 1325, you're in trouble. You have to be an incredible genius uh, and work with your Roman numerals or, or epicycles in order to get something, simply because the context is very poor. We call those ideas choosing the right representation in computer science. I'd also read a book by Hadamard, uh, who did a survey of the top 100 mathematicians in the world. And, and being French, he included himself in that top 100. <laughs> um, but in fact, he was. Uh, I always thought he did this in order to atone for having invented the Hadamard transform and force us all to learn it. Uh, but his survey indicated that of these top 100, only a few claimed to use symbolization at all. They all claim to use visualizations of some kind. An amazing 30%, including Einstein, were operated down here. Einstein's uh, quote was, I have sensations of a kinesthetic or muscular type. So Einstein actually could feel in his arms, in particular, the spaces that he was dealing with. So this Hadamard's book is the cliche, genius is the ability to recapture childhood at will. Or you can look at it from Brunner's point of view and say, that people we think are creative are able to think in more than one scheme. And uh, the most creative people are the people who can move from one scheme to the other. Um, I also, this also reminded me of a lot of musicians that I'd read about that, like great artists, conceive their works down here where the blood and guts flows. <clears throat> and then in our civilization, they bring it over here where, they, where you can apply six centuries of technique to make it the most beautiful thing that can be imagined. So this notion of being able to move from one to another was very powerful. And also this idea that when you try and explain things to people, the weakest way is to tell it. Better to show them. That's why we started giving demos right away. <laughs> but much better to get them to do it. And that was something that we didn't do so well at. We didn't sit them down often enough in front of the terminals themselves and so they could get this visceral feel until many years too late. So this idea that there are different ways in leads to this little experiment you can try. This is inspired by Seymour Papert. And that is to take a child in each of these three stages or mentalities and get them to try and draw a circle and logo. And Papert had done it with very young children by just getting them to close their eyes and say, make a circle with your body. So the kid would start going like this. And if he didn't fall off the stage, uh, you could ask the child, what are you doing, Johnny? And the child would say, well, I'm going a little and turning a little over and over. And if you type that into logo, you get a perfect circle. And that's because the five-year-old knows differential equations. <laughs> right? The cir circle is, has constant curvature, and so the change in curvature is 0. And Papert explicitly made logo eco egocentric, inertial coordinate systems, in order so that the, chi the kid could play the turtle be the turtle and use what his body, his body knew what his mind did not, if you will. Uh, if you do it with a 10-year-old, you get a much different set of results. The 10-year-old really doesn't want to do that. 10-year-old tends to be very visual. 
And so a way to get them to do is you give them a compass and let them draw lots of circles. And after a while, they decide, gee, the, the compass is a constant distance y, so the points are the same distance apart. This ought to work. And so you pick the pin up, <coughs> go out to the rim, make a dot. You come back, turn one degree. <coughs> round you go, and you get a perfect circle. Locus of points equidistant from a given point. Um, now, of course, I wouldn't be telling this story if the 15-year-old succeeded. 15-year-old is in this symbolic fact logic stage and knows the most horrible fact ever discovered by man. <laughs> okay. wrong, wrong coordinate system, and even if it were a good coordinate system, it has very little operational significance. So this led to a, uh, a slogan. I like to do things by, by slogan. Uh, I later discovered people used to complain to me uh, that it wasn't being professional. I finally found that Francis Bacon in the New Organum, which uh, has to be a classical enough text to inspire anybody, 1535 or something, Francis Bacon pointed out there are two ways you can explain things. One is in prose, in which, in which you essentially defeat involvement by explaining everything. The other is by form of an aphorism, uh, which draws people in and tries to get them to complete it themselves. And so my characterization of this is that point of view is worth 80 IQ points. Right? In other words, if you're in the right context, you, you act as though you're incredibly smart and able. And if you're in the wrong context, uh, you don't. De Bono has an image of if you're digging for gold and you've dug down five feet and you haven't found it, one of the things you can do is dig twice as fast. That's American business. When in trouble, redouble your efforts. But in fact, you might be in trouble because you're digging in the wrong place. You might be doing the wrong kinds of things. You might be having the wrong kinds of thoughts. So maybe you should shift your context. And anyway, this, this idea, set of ideas, now again, I want to say that we didn't talk about things exactly this way. We read Brunner a lot. And in fact, it was Adele who solved how to use Brunner with the children, as you'll see in a minute. That led to a slogan. <coughs> 